Hi guys, it's Mark Zickery, Mr. Sci-Fi, also known as Mark Zickery of Space Command. A lot of great stuff is happening with Space Command. We just had a, uh, a meeting with our VFX team the other day, and the shots are coming out spectacularly. They're generating the uh, first 33 minutes uh, with color correction, VFX, everything. Now, many of you know that in the first two hours of Space Command, which we've shot along with the 30 minutes of the second two hours, and uh, currently rewriting the script of the third two hours, um, it's in the first two hours there's 1900 visual effects shots and I'm told 18 shots that don't have visual effects 18 shots but, uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today we'll talk about that all very soon uh, I'm here to talk about it's interesting this uh, this past week Guardians of the Galaxy 2 came out and that's cool and we'll probably talk a little bit about that but the really interesting thing that happened was that yesterday a new trailer for Blade Runner 2049 came out and I want to talk about Blade Runner and its sequel and, uh, and where things stand and, and all of that because uh, for me Blade Runner is one of the absolute high points of science fiction a spectacular movie, one of my favorites and, uh, and the question is really will, will the sequel be, um, be up to snuff? Will it be a worthy successor? And in some cases there are sequels that have been uh, the equal or the superior of the previous movie. For instance, a lot of people like Bride of Frankenstein better than the original Frankenstein, but in that case it was um, the same creative team. But, uh, but Blade Runner 2049 is being produced by Ridley Scott, whereas he originally directed the original Blade Runner back in 1982. Uh, when it first came out, it was not a success, uh, though when I first saw it, I thought it was a terrific movie. I was, I was blown away by it. Many of you know that it's gone through many, many different iterations. The original version had a voiceover. Uh, it had a really wacky ending that used outtakes from The Shining, uh, this, this footage driving, driving along. Uh, you know, and uh, and and also it had in the voiceover supposedly uh, Harrison Ford deliberately gave a very very bad line reading so that in the hope that the voiceover wouldn't be used, all sorts of stuff. There's a terrific uh, Blu-ray set of Blade Runner that has the director's cut, the final cut, the original cut, and also if you get one version, it also includes the rough cut of the film, which is very interesting, the working cut. Um, so, uh, and there's some wonderful uh, making of featurettes on that Blu-ray, and it's also, I think, available in DVD. Uh, and beyond that, there's a wonderful British documentary on the making of Blade Runner called The Edge of Blade Runner, and you can find that now on YouTube, uh, though I bought it years ago on, on eBay. And uh, beyond that, there's a great book on the making of Blade Runner, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it goes into all of the details. And years ago, Cine Fantastique, back in 1982, did a double issue on the making of Blade Runner and the making of Wrath of Khan, another one of my favorite movies. And you can probably hunt that up. And again, it has spectacular uh, images and interviews and uh, just phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. So. And then the, the development of Blade Runner is fascinating. Uh, it was based on a novel by Philip K. Dick, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Philip K. Dick, of course, also wrote uh, Man in the High Castle. He wrote Minority Report, you know, the original versions that, uh, that the movies were based on and the, and the TV shows. And he's undergoing a, um, a renaissance now, although he's been, been gone for many years. He, uh, there's going to be a new TV series of his stories with Ron Moore of Battlestar Galactica and Star Trek The Next Generation and Outlander running that show. Uh, so that should probably be very, very good. But Blade Runner is a fascinating study in how to adapt a novel and do a very different kind of story where, where you're utilizing the original book as a guide and a template, but then doing something else. And the fascinating thing about Blade Runner is it switches uh, genre in, in its adaptation from book to movie because the book is Philip K. Dick, Dick wrote male female relationships very um, in a very troubled way. He, his own relationships were very troubled. He was a very troubled man, but a brilliant man, a wonderful writer. And uh, but though, of course, you know, if you there's also a number of biographies about Philip K. Dick, and you can study his his amazing life. He wrote 12 novels in one year with the help of amphetamines. He uh, he was just always cranking and writing against you know budgetary constraints, time constraints, uh, pouring out novels and short stories. This was when science fiction novels paid very very little, a thousand dollars, three thousand uh, dollars. You know, you're writing for a five cents a word, ten cents a word for short stories, and uh, so you constantly had to keep cranking out the material. Uh, Philip K. Dick actually originally did not want to be a science fiction writer; he wanted to be a mainstream novelist, and he wrote a number of mainstream novels that did not sell in his lifetime. Now they've all been published, 
and uh, and so he turned to science fiction. But but of course, I, I find his science fiction, you know, wonderful. And uh, and the, what he was examining in science fiction, the nature of reality, the nature of humanity, were issues much better suited to science fiction than to mainstream prose. And uh, and it's funny because again with Serling, Rod Serling never wanted to be a science fiction writer either. But um, but censorship forced him into twi into doing Twilight Zone. So we're very lucky that uh, <laughs> that these men had their frustrations. Otherwise, we would not have had have these amazing works of um, of literature in uh, in film, TV, and books that we have thanks to their their endeavors. And uh, but so with 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 so so Phil Kiddick wrote Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? It's a very good novel. You can you can read it or you can get it on audio. Uh, there's it, 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 there's also a an abridged version on audio that Callista Flockhart and I think Matthew Modine read and that's very entertaining too. You can find that on eBay in, in used copies and possibly on Amazon. But um, but it's it's a very it's a, got a very different tone than the, than the movie because I mentioned that Blade Runner switches genres because the the. The book is is a, is much more an examination of humanity in a certain way. Philip K. Dick viewed the 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 androids, which he called Andes in the book, uh, as lacking empathy, lacking compassion, and so not not human. And he was examining what it is that makes us human and playing with the notion of um, the main character at one point being fooled to think that he might be an android, and then realizing he's not. And uh, and it w it's a very, very good book, but very cold in, a, in its way. And the relationships between the hero and his wife, the relationship between the hero and his wife is a very um, troubled one. And uh, when, the, when the movie was made, though, it switched to noir romance. And that's future noir. And, um, and that works spectacularly well. It's, uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's terrific. It's a love story. It's a man about a man who regains his humanity. Now, there's also, of course, this great disagreement as to whether the main character is a, is a replicant. They came up with a great term, replicant, because android sounded goofy, and it does. But uh, replicant is a terrific phrase. And, uh, and in the original version, he's a human, Rick Deckard. But then, of course, in the final version that Ridley Scott ultimately, ultimately made, it, uh, Rick Deckard is a, is a replicant. And Harrison Ford vehemently disagrees with that. The writer, uh, one of the writers, vehemently disagrees with that. Uh, maybe even both of the writers, for all I know. Uh, and, um, and, and yet, Ridley Scott sticks by his guns. Now, if you look at the final cut, it's very obvious. Because the, the way they did, did the, uh, the, the, the red eyes was, you know, when, you, when you're taking still photographs and you get red eyes in a flash photograph, you're basically seeing the back of the eye. And so they basically did that with a moving image by having certain lighting um, pull off that effect. And it's clear that the one image that shows Deckard with those, those replicant eyes, he clearly has just moved on the wrong mark. He's out of focus. He's in the background. It's not deliberate. It's an accident. It's very clear from the way the shot is set up that it was just, you know, well, it would be an outtake. It would be something that wouldn't be used, nor should it. Um, I think it, it's one step too many to make Deckard a replicant. I think it, the, the story of a man who regains his humanity by falling in love with, with a replicant is a very moving story. If he's a replicant, it's like, well, what, what is the point here? What are we looking at? And it's just, I think, Ridley Scott being too clever for his own good. And, uh, but even so, you know, whatever version you're looking at of Blade Runner, it's still spectacular. It's visually amazing. Doug Trumbull was, did a phenomenal job. My friend Greg Jean um, built the city, was one of the people who built the city. I now own part of that city from Blade Runner, which is one of my prized possessions. And, uh, and I can just watch that film over and over and over again. The score of course, is, is, is spectacular, phenomenal, unique by Vangelis, and, uh, which, and it is, from what I hear, it's pronounced Vangelis, although most people say Vangelis, including myself. And, uh, but again, it just, it just holds up. You know, Rachel is terrific. The actors are, are all phenomenal. Rutger Hauer is, is, is great. And I got to work with James Hong in Space Command, and he's, he's you know, great in Blade Runner, just uh, unforgettable. Everything about Blade Runner is just first class. There's no weakness in it. The spinners designed by Sid Mead are um, wonderful. And the fact that Ridley Scott had his, he shot in LA and he also in the Bradbury building among other, among other places. My friend Doug Hayes, who uh, was one of the great directors of Twilight Zone, took me on a tour of, of that building many years ago. And, uh, and it's, it's wonderful. It's also featured in City on the Edge of Forever, which is, I'm not City on the Edge of Forever, I'm thinking Harlan Ellison. It's, uh, Harlan wrote an episode of Outer Limits called Demon with a Glass Hand that was also shot in the Bradbury Building. There's many things shot in the Bradbury Building, but, uh, but, but everything in, in Blade Runner is exemplary. That, 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 uh, uh, 
uh, airship, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, the uh, new life awaits you in the off-world colonies. The airship uh, is. I saw the actual airship that was used in that shot, and when it was on exhibit at uh, at Warner Brothers at one point, and it's very thrown together, very jury-rigged, and it's fun to see what it really looks like up close. And but in the film, it looks just spectacular. You know, it, it creates it creates a world, and the fun part, of course, is that it's set in 2019, two years from now. We don't have our flying cars, we don't have our replicants, unless I haven't been keeping current with the news. And so that, of course, presents a, um, a challenge for for Blade Runner 2049 because, and it's one that they actually dealt with in, in the Independence Day, the the, 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 the less than to be desired uh, Independence Day sequel took place in an alternate Earth where several decades earlier Earth was invaded. So clearly Blade Runner will be in an alternate reality and the fact that they in the new in the new trailer they released which shows Atari, you know, it's saying, okay, this is a nod to the fact that this is not our world, this is a parallel world that continues from 2019 where Blade Runner took place. But the, but the history of Blade Runner as a property has been fascinating and uh, I'll, I'll walk through a little of it with you. And um, and, and we'll talk about it. First of all, the, the, the trailer is, um, is spectacular. Maybe we'll attach it here or attach a link, or you can go find it. But it, you know, Dennis, uh, Villeneuve, Denis Villeneuve, who did The Arrival and many other films, um, Sicario, etc. cetera, he, um, he's the director. And I was very worried about him being the director until I saw Arrival, and I said, okay, maybe this guy can do a Blade Runner sequel. The trailer looks great. Jared Leto is, is, is wonderful. Um, you know, it's great to have Harrison Ford back playing Deckard. Uh, Dave Bautista of Guardians of the Galaxy is in it. They put him in little glasses, which is a very interesting look for him. I mean, everything in the, in the trailer looks like the movie will be, will be wonderful, and I hope it will be wonderful. You can never tell. There are many great trailers for very, very poor movies, and, uh, and I, that's why I love trailers, by the way, because a trailer, it's very rare that you see a bad trailer, and, uh, and you know, there's many, many more wonderful trailers than wonderful movies, and, uh, so you know that's so. So the trailers are are always some of my favorite. It's usually my favorite part of going to the movies, because you can watch it and you can see, you know, what what the possibility might be. So, but with with Blade Runner, with the original Blade Runner, it was you know studying how it got made. There were two writers on it. They, I've I've read the original drafts of of, of both of their their endeavors, and and the, the the original drafts of Blade Runner. Read the scripts. Go online. Find the scripts. They're 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 fun. They're great. They have fascinating details. It's it's. I mean, it's just. You know, it's it's really fun to read the scripts, and then the movie was shot, and Harrison Ford and Ridley Scott did not get along well. It was uh, it was not a happy shoot, and um, and yet it created this great work of art. And and they went back on the on the final cut. They did go back and fix things. Joanna Cassidy, you know, the the, the thing where she gets shot, and uh, now now it matches. They put they reshot with her, so it doesn't look like a bad stunt double uh, in a bad wig anymore. And so they've corrected a lot of things. So, so other than the fact that Deckard is a replicant in the final cut, um, the, the final version has many, many, many uh, beauties and things to admire in it. But then the fascinating thing was uh, Bud Yorkin, who was one of the producers and put up the money, some of the money, he, uh, the movie went over budget, so he had a very bad taste in his mouth about Blade Runner. He, had been, he was Norman Lear's partner in Tandem at the time. Tandem was the company. And, um, and so for many years there were no products of Blade Runner. When the movie came out, there were these little miniature cars and spinners, and I, I actually own one of those spinners. Uh, you can, again, get them on eBay, which is a wonderful resource for those of us who are fanboys and fangirls. Um, but, um, but there were very few, uh, you know, there was a graphic novel, and, uh, and they re-released Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep with a Blade Runner cover, but there weren't a lot of toys or, or products. Part of that was because the movie wasn't successful, but in years after, nothing came out, even as the movie became a, a huge favorite. And so um, it was partially because Bud Yorkin had a very bad taste in his mouth about Blade Runner. So it, it, at one point, K.W. Jeter, who had been a protege of Philip K. Dick, wanted to write Blade Runner novels, and he found out that unless uh, the, the rights holders in Blade Runner exploited it in some new way, uh, they, had, they risked losing the rights to, to, the, to the property. So he approached the rights holders with that fact and, they were, and, and got them to let him write a Blade Runner sequel. So there are, there are three novels of Blade Runner that K.W. Jeter wrote, so you can check them out. He's also one of the great steampunk writers. He wrote the, one of the first steampunk novels and, uh, and, and called Morlock Knight, which is a sequel to The Time Machine. And uh, 
but, uh, but the first two novels were published here in America. The third one was only published in, in England. But you can, you can track them down on Amazon and eBay and so forth and read them and see what, uh, what some other alternative sequels to Blade Runner um, are like. And then, and then the, new, the new movie, one of the writers of the original Blade Runner, Hampton Fancher, is aboard, and, and a new screenwriter as well who's uh, been doing some very good movies lately. And, uh, and it looks great. It looks great. The visuals are all spectacular. They're on a much bigger scale. It's very funny because uh, Ridley Scott was given a small backlot street to shoot most of Blade Runner, and so he put all that fog in and all those lights and moved the pieces around and, and filled it with extras, uh, I mean people. And, uh, and, so, and actually that, that tightness, that claustrophobic feeling aids the original Blade Runner. So we'll see if the larger scale works for the new one. But, um, but, you know, but, but with sequels, you can never tell. Uh, Chinatown had the two Jakes. Most sequels are lousy. Most sequels don't work. But every now and then you get one. For instance, Aliens uh, is a great sequel to Alien, another Ridley Scott masterpiece. And, um, but in that case, of course, with Alien, uh, Alien is a horror movie, and Aliens is an action picture. So, so James Cameron wisely changed uh, genres, and of course he was highly influenced by Starship Troopers and so forth. So, you know, we're all uh, we're all influenced by the things that move us, the things we watch, the things we read, and and if we're lucky, we create great great art. It's fascinating because I'm now working, of course, on finishing the first two hours of Space Command, and it deals with synthetics and uh, artificial humans. And so there are elements in Blade Runner, elements in Blade Runner 2, and elements in a lot of other science fiction where we'll see um, you know, my take on things and, and Ridley Scott's, etc. Though, though fortunately, my take is very different from what they're doing, thank God. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll see how all of this goes. But, um, but anyway, so that's, that's it. I think, I mean, I'll, I think I'll talk about uh, Guardians of the Galaxy in another video, and soon we'll talk about Space Command and, and where we are and all of that. So, but I just want to kind of share some of this with you because uh, there's a great quality of anticipation. It's very fun waiting for a movie that you're eagerly anticipating. The new Alien movie is coming out too. I have less uh, hope about that. Though it looks very, very good, but, you know, again, it's a bag of tricks we've seen. So... Um, so all will be known. <laughs> all will be known. The Alien movie comes out this month, and, uh, and Blade Runner comes out in October. So we shall see. All will be known. So for now, it's Mark Zikri, Mr. Sci-Fi, Mark Zikri of Space Command. Uh, uh, you can subscribe to Mr. Sci-Fi on the YouTube channel. You can reach out to me at markzikri.com, markzikri at gmail.com. You can check out Space Command uh, on the Mark Zikri website, markzikri.com. And... Uh, Lots, lots coming down the pike. Lots to talk about soon. Thanks a lot. Take care, guys. Bye. Every civilization was built off the back of a disposable workforce. But I can only make so many. Shh. Happy birthday. There is an order to things. That's what we do here. We keep order. The world is built on a wall that separates kind. Tell either side there's no wall. You bought a war. You're a cop. I had your job once. I was good at it. I know. What do you want? I want to ask you some questions. The key to the future. It's finally unearthed. Bring it to me. They know you're here. I always told you, you're special. Your story isn't over yet. There's still a page left. <laughs>